I have discovered something very interesting. I've discovered uh, how the New England Patriots win all the time. Now, they didn't win last Thursday night, praise God, but they win a lot. I mean, how many Super Bowls now? Five? Uh, just, just steamrolling, and it just seems every year they just get better and better, and they don't lose a step. And I realize it's because they're united. They are a united team. And then I realized, you know, the reason that they're united. Anybody want to take a guess? I'm just going to tell you why they're united. They're united because they all wear the same jersey. It's amazing. And I, it just dawned on me. I was just like, you know, I was thinking, I was like, why are they so good all the time? How come they beat the Bills all the time? And I realized it's because they have the same jerseys on. If we could just take those jerseys off and we get them, you know, just to wear different jerseys, then they wouldn't be any good anymore, right? You and I know that's ridiculous because every other team wears a jersey. You see, it's not what's on the outside that unites us. It's what's on the inside that unites us. I'd like you to write that in your notes. I know you got notes this morning. I want you to write this quote. Unity does not come from without, but from within. Unity does not come from without, but from within. Amen? I'm going to give it to you one more time. I hope it sticks in your brain this morning. Because this is the main thought of the message. We're going to go through different attitudes that we need to have. But unity does not come from without, but from within. After you've written that down on your notes, I want you to turn to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. We've been studying through the book of Philippians on Wednesday nights and uh, been, been just blessed by it. And I didn't intend for us to be in Philippians on Sunday morning. The Lord just sort of worked it out like this. But Philippians chapter 2 and we're going to just look at verses 1 and 2 this morning. If you're there, say a hearty amen. amen. We'll give you a little more time. <laughs> if you're there now, say a hearty amen. amen. And then would you stand with me as we read the Word of God this morning. Philippians chapter 2, Paul is speaking. Of course, the Lord is speaking through Paul to the church at Philippi. And this is what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ... If there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Let's go to the Lord. Father God, we ask that you would speak mightily through your word this morning, that you would just talk to our hearts. Father, help us to just eliminate all distractions and to focus on your word. Lord, I pray that the name of Jesus Christ would be lifted up this morning. I pray that the word of God would be received in every single heart, Lord, not just in mind or in theory or with words, but God, that we would leave this place, Lord, ready to obey what you have commanded of us, Lord, so that we as a people, as a church, would be united together. We thank you and we praise you. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. I want us to look at uh, some attitudes that will unite us. I have on your notes four attitudes that will unite us. Now, I want to give you just a disclaimer this morning. Um, this message ran a little long when I was going through it, and, uh, and so we, this might be a two-part message, all right? So y'all need to come back next week. Uh, but we'll look at at least two attitudes that will unite us this morning. So bring your notes back next week. But here's the very first attitude that will unite us. And when I say us, I'm speaking of our church, okay? And if you go somewhere else, this is the same for your church that you attend as well. Wherever you are a part of the local body of Christ, these attributes, these attitudes will help unite you with the other members of your church. The first is this, we must think the same way. We must think the same way. And you might be thinking, well, that, that's a little dangerous, isn't it? We don't all want to think the same way. Well, about certain things we do. Verse number two, Paul makes it very clear that this is what God wants us to do. He says, make my joy complete. Philippians is about joy, and he says, this will complete my joy. This will fulfill my joy. That you be of the same what? Mind. Mind. That you be of the same mind. Guys, have you ever had your spouse, your wife, lean over and say, what are you thinking about? <laughs> what, what are you thinking about? And I'm like, nothing. I'm just driving, right? <laughs> what are you thinking about? 
football, usually a second answer, right? What are you thinking about? The church, right? We've all done that, right? We've asked somebody, what are you thinking about? And here, when he's talking about your mind, he's talking about your continual thoughts, and really he's talking about your attitude. So it's not just, you know, your thoughts. He's talking about your overall demeanor, your overall disposition, your overall attitude as a believer in Jesus Christ. When he says same mind, or your version might say like-minded, it literally means to think the same thing. So the question is, how does Paul want us to think? And the answer is very simple and very straightforward. He wants you and I to think like a servant. He wants you and me to think like a servant, just like Jesus. Our whole series, this whole series has been what? Be like Jesus. And if we're going to be like Jesus, we have to think like Jesus. And the MO of Jesus, the thing that we see time after time after time in Scripture, is that Jesus was a servant and he was always thinking with a servant mind. Amen? In fact, Paul tells us that very clearly. If you go down to verse number 7, everybody go to verse number 7 in Philippians chapter 2. Paul says this, speaking of Jesus, he says, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a what? Servant or slave in some translations. Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords, God in the flesh, thought like a servant. This was the attitude of Christ. See, Christ didn't come to the earth to be served. He came to serve. Amen? If we are able to be united in spirit, if we are going to be united as a church, listen, let me, let me tell you something. Our country will never be united. Not unanimously. The only way that will ever happen is when we realize the truth of the word of God, Jesus Christ as Lord, and that we submit to him. You think that's going to happen? You see, the hope of the world, God says, is the church. It's not any individual person, not an individual political leader. It's not any organization. It is plan A, the church of God. Why? Because we have the message that saves, the message of Jesus Christ. That he has come to seek and to save sinners and he did this mainly through his earthly life as a servant. Now, one day he's coming back not as a servant, right? One day he's coming back as a ruling king to conquer and to make his enemies submit to him. But in the New Testament, we see over and over and over again that Christ is a servant. James 4.1 tells us where your problems and my problems come within the church. Anybody ever been in a fight with another church member? Not physically, right? But some type of altercation, some type of disagreement. Come on, let's be honest this morning. Everybody probably has, right? And James 4.1 tells us where those fights come from. Listen, James 4.1. What causes fights and quarrels among you in the body of Christ? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? What is he saying? He's saying it comes from selfishness. I want it my way. I don't agree with you, and so I'm going to fight with you. Selfishness and a lack of servant-heartedness. You see, one of the major reasons that we fight inside the church and argue inside the church is because people treat us like servants. And we get automatically offended because we feel what? We feel disrespected. How dare you treat me like that? How dare you ask me to do that? How dare you talk to me like that, right? We automatically get offended and we feel like others are not respecting our position. See, church members don't mind serving on occasion, but don't ever treat them like servants. However, Christ took on the very nature of a servant. You see, he wasn't simply a king that was serving. Jesus wasn't simply a king that was serving. He was a king who was a servant. He didn't have to go out of himself to serve. It just who, it's who he was in his inner being. And he calls you and me to serve as well. 
his overall attitude was consumed with others, not himself. Let me ask you this morning, is that your attitude? When you come to church, do you come through the doors and wonder, oh, how am I going to be blessed this morning? I hope Pastor Dave really talks to me about something that's going on in my life and can help me in this situation. Listen, that's not all bad. But one attitude that we should have when we come together as a church is what's going on in the lives of other people around me. How can I serve them? How can I help them? Yesterday was a great day. Amen? For y'all that weren't here, it might not have been, I don't know. But for the people that were here for the work day, man, it was a great day. We had almost 40 people show up. We knocked things out, man. Uh, many, many hands make light work, right? And, and I just love to see, man, I, I love to see the work of our people and the, and the servant-heartedness of our people. And I, and I think about two people that I mentioned in prayer time that did the nastiest, dirtiest job of everybody, right? Anybody know who it was? Yeah, Jillian and Cassidy, and my wife, and a few others. I believe there's a, a young kid. Who was the kid in there? There was a kid helping out in there, too. Anybody remember who that was? I don't know, but that, I was just like, Bleh. that's gross, right? I said, we need a really deep clean in the bathroom, and they said, we'll do it. <laughs> we'll do it, right? They were a little shy, but they did it. And, they, and, and you know, everything needed to be done. So, but, but I just thought, man, what, what servant-heartedness, right? It's not beneath them to do that. You see, when we begin to think, oh, well, I'm, I'm too good for that. I can't do that in the church. Come on, seriously? That's not thinking like Christ at all. You see, what he's calling us to do, what Paul, what the Lord is selling, saying through Paul, is, is for us to think humbly. To think humbly. And we get humility mixed up in our, in our culture, <laughs> Because we see an athlete on TV, right? They've got the jersey on. And they're like, oh, man, I'm just so humble. I'm just so humble for God. I'm just so humble. I'm like, no, you're saying you're humble. That's not being humble, <laughs> right? You see, humility is very simple. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is thinking of yourself less. It's seeing everybody else first. And Paul sums up what the humble mind looks like for you and for me in Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4. Everybody look at verse 3. If you're with me this morning, say amen. amen. He says in verse 3, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. Empty conceit is pride. Do nothing from selfishness, selfish motives, or pride, but with humility of what? Mind. With humility of thought, with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. He's saying, listen, this is how you're to think. You're to think that everybody else is more valuable and more important than you. Now, this doesn't mean you become a human doormat. This doesn't mean you, this doesn't mean you become a yes man or a yes woman to everything that everybody says. But your overall attitude should be, how can I help them? How can I lift them up? How can I help them grow in Christ Jesus? How can I alleviate their burdens? What can I do for them rather than thinking all about me? Now, let me ask you, is this counterculture? Big time, right? Because now we live in a day of... Right? That was, a, that was the worst selfie ever, wasn't it? <laughs> I should have actually done it right there. I didn't. It's all about the self. It's all about self. It's all about me, right? How can I get paid? How can I get the things I want? How can I get the money and the mansion and the girl and all the things? And how can I live out my dream? How can I be what I want, what I want to be? And the mind and the thought and the attitude of Jesus is 100% opposite of that. And it's so obvious. And it's so clear, and yet sometimes we just think, oh, it's, it really truly is about me. If we're going to be united as a church, what I saw yesterday was this type of attitude. What a joy for a pastor to see that in his congregation. 
Now, I know some people had to work, some people had other obligations, and I'm not just narrowing it down to that one day, that one thing, but the overall attitude. I hope that when you go to bed at night, in your prayers, some point in the morning when you wake up, in the middle of the day when you're working, you're thinking about someone else in this church. I wonder how their family's doing. They're in the midst of that storm. I wonder if they got the car that they needed when they said their car broke down. I wonder how I could help so-and-so with this need. It's others first, others first. And listen, folks, we talked about it in Sunday school this morning. This does not come naturally because the Bible says that the heart of man is desperately wicked above all things and who can know it. Our natural tendency, like you're driving on a road and you know how the roads are slanted, our natural tendency, if we take our hands off the wheel, is to what? We drift. And that's where our heart takes us as well. You know where we drift? It's not to God and it's not to others, it's to me. My needs, my selfishness. We must be intentional about thinking the same way. We must be intentional about having servant-hearted uh, minds and servant-heartedness in our lives. We must be intentional about thinking less about ourselves and more about other people. Romans twelve sixteen says, Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not, do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. We're not talking about, woe is me, I'm, I'm no good. No, no. You need to know who you are in Jesus Christ. And I would suggest you read Ephesians 1, 2, and 3 because it tells you exactly who you are in Jesus Christ. You are a son of the king. You are bought with a price. You are redeemed. You are a child of God. And so that's where you build your confidence and your self-esteem and all those things that the world tells you you need to get from outside influences. God says, no, that comes from being who you are in Jesus Christ. And then when who you are in Jesus Christ is realized, you begin to think like Jesus Christ and the mind of Jesus Christ Christ says one word, others, 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 others. It's not about you. If this church is about you, you're going to be miserable. And eventually you're going to leave. Because this church is about Jesus Christ and his glory and about other people. That's why the church exists. It's to bring the lost to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. That's our mission. That's our desire. That's our goal. God is speaking through Paul, and he says, if you want to be united as a church, you must think the same way. And I want to pray right now for our church, that we would be united in spirit, that we would be united in thought, that we would be united in this servant-mindedness that Christ has shown us. Would you bow with me? Father God, we pray right now, God, for our church. And maybe there's folks here who go to other churches. I pray that, that every single heart, every single a uh, person that hears these words this morning. God, that they would first understand and recognize the need to be servant-minded like Jesus Christ. How can we say that we are like Jesus and only think of ourselves? Lord, the answer is we can't. So I pray right now for every single person who is hearing this message, God, that you would burden their hearts, burden their souls to be like Jesus with a servant's heart that they would humble themselves moment by moment in their day and look intentionally for opportunities to serve other people. That our church, that Cornerstone Baptist Church, would be a church that cares about others, that puts others first, Lord, that is here for one another. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The second attitude I want to speak to you this morning about that will unite us is this. We must love the same way. You see, a lot of these are going to be like, oh yeah, that's obvious. But doing and knowing are completely different, right? We must love the same way. He tells us that in verse number two. He says, make my joy complete by what? Being of the same mind, that is having the same thought, the same servant-hearted mind, the same servant-heartedness of Jesus Christ. And then he says, maintaining the same what? Love. And I want you to notice, I don't know if your version has it, but it says maintaining the same love because the natural tendency for you or for me is to stop loving. <laughs> it's hard to love sometimes. The Greek word here for love is the word, anybody know it? I know some of you do. Agape. 
You see, there are different forms of love, and this is agape love. Agape love, to be quite clear and quite plain, is God's love. It's the type of love that God loves with. Agape love is not emotional love. Agape love is not a selfish love. See, what you're going to hear most of the time in your world, whether it be through TV or friends or songs on the radio or whatever, what you're going to hear is this. Love is about you. If you don't have those feelings anymore, it's time to move on. Love is how you feel. It's about emotion. And so people get divorced. People break up. People stop talking with relatives and friends all because of one reason. They don't feel like they love them anymore. This is not the type of love that God is talking about here. Agape love is willful. It is willful love. That is, you have a choice. Listen, this is the type of love that needs to come first in a marriage. It's not whether or not you're attracted to the person. It's not whether or not, oh, well, our personalities get along great. The type of love that makes a marriage work is agape love. It's love that is a choice, and that sounds really unromantic, doesn't it? But it's the truth. And if you dig through the scriptures, you see time and time again that God calls the Christian in the marriage relationship to love with agape, God-like love. It's a willful love. Agape loves, agape love says, I, listen, big word, I want you to write this down. I choose to love you even when you're unlovable. I choose to love you even when you are unlovable. Nikki's got a lot of experience in this. <laughs> she chooses day after day to love me in the midst of my mood swings. She chooses to love me when I'm rude or unkind. And I sometimes do the same back. <laughs> See, that's the type of love that God is calling you and me to have. Listen. Listen. For the church, for the church, for the person sitting next to you, behind you, in front of you, it's a willful love. Agape love says, I will, here's another big word, that's not a big word at all, it's an important word, I will commit to love you, no matter how much you harm me or do me wrong. Talk about counterculture, right? Right? The moment somebody spurns us, stabs us in the back, or burns us, what do we do? Nope, not anymore. <laughs> there are people who have left this church, have burned me, have slandered my name, have talked bad about even our whole church. You know what God calls us to do to them? Love them. Because God's love is unconditional love. It's a willful love. It's a decision that we make. Romans 5, 8. You say, where does this come from? Romans 5, 8, but God. But God. Man, we could preach just on that. <laughs> but God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ did what? He died for us. You see, Christ made a choice to love us. So much so that he died for us. Now listen, this is where it gets practical real quick. Because agape love is an act of the will, because agape love is a choice, it can be commanded by God. That's why God can say, love your neighbor, even when you don't want to love your neighbor. That's why God can over and over say, love me, love me, love me, praise me, because it's a choice of the human heart. It's also our choice. And it's a moment by moment by moment decision to love someone else in this church. It's willful. Not only that, agape love is sacrificial. You see, at its greatest height, sacrificial love gives up its very life, right? That's the best, okay? The greatest love that anyone can have, the Bible says, is that he lay down his life for a friend. That you give up your life for someone, right? That's the greatest type of love. Amen? 
The greatest love is that you would give your life up for someone else. Amen? Amen. And so many of you might say, you know what? I would give my life up for for some folks in here. In fact, I think, David, I think I would lay down my life for, for other people in this church. But if you think about that for a moment and then think about the reality of the situation. Because the reality of the situation is that many people won't even live for the other people in this room. It's easy in theory to say, I'll lay down my life for someone else. It's a lot more difficult in practice to say, I'm going to live for the body of Christ and for his glory. It's a lot more difficult to say, I'm going to sacrifice something of my time, my effort, my talents, my money. That's agape love. John 15, 13 says, greater love has no one than this. Then one laid down his life for his friends. We just quoted that. And I want you to just think about that for a moment. You see, that tells you how close your relationships are in this church. And if we're going to be unified, if we're going to be one church, like a good sports team is one team, the thing that's going to unite us is this type of sacrificial love. So who in this church would you lay down your life for? Who are you living for in this church? Who are you concerned about in this church? Who are you praying for in this church? And that's undergirded by having the servant-hearted mind. You see, he's building something here. He's building the very foundation of the church of God. Lastly, agape love is practical. It's very, very practical. 1 John 3, 17 and 18 says, But whoever has this world's goods, that is, whoever has this world's money or things or possessions, and sees his brother in need. He's speaking about brother or sister in Christ. Okay, He's talking about the spiritual family of God, the church. Whoever sees his family member in the church of God in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. You see, real godly love is practical. Do you even know of any needs in this church? We can't say we love the church of God. We can't say we love Cornerstone Baptist and then not be practical about it. Al Mohler says this great quote. He said, agape love is not simply saying that you love the church, it is being, I love this, it is being overwhelmed with a desire to serve the church and meet one another's needs. Let me just give you a little insight into the heart of God real quick. You want to know who really loves God? It's the person that loves the church. That's the person who loves God. How do I know that? Because scripture tells us. And because Jesus Christ died for the church. It's his bride, the Bible says. He loves her unlike any other thing that has ever existed, so much so that he died on the cross for her. So if Jesus Christ loves the church that much, the implication is that you, the believer in the church, ought to love the church like Jesus Christ loves the church. It's a willful love. It's a sacrificial love. It's a practical love. I feel like this morning I'm preaching this message as a follow-up of encouragement from yesterday. You guys loved the church yesterday. That was great to see. It was such an encouragement. And you know that somebody loves you when they do what? They spend their money on you. They spend their time with you, right? Right? That's how you know if you love the church. You say, Dave, I thought it was just being, about good, being a good person in the world. No, no, God's, God's conduit for his mercy and his grace is the church of Jesus Christ. As the church is unified and as the church is built up, Christ receives glory and people get saved. There's no such thing in the word of God as a lone ranger Christian. Amen? We're not called to do it alone. He has given us the church The church is for us, and we are for the church. Let me tell you this morning, if your love is selfish, if it's the love of the world and only concerned about yourself, you will only love the church as long as the church doesn't disappoint you. 
As long as the church pays attention to you, as long as the church meets your needs, then you'll love the church. That's not agape love. That will not unite the church. That will divide the church every single time. Agape love is willful, it's sacrificial, and it's practical. So let me put it to you this morning. Is that how you love your church? Father God, we pray for our church right now. Lord, we pray specifically that you and you alone would ignite in our hearts a love for other people in this church. That we would be strengthened, Lord, to love by choice, Lord. To love sacrificially, to love practically. Father, that we would simply allow you to work in our hearts to seek others first, Lord. To seek their good, to put their needs above our own, Father. And that we would love our church family and our church body like you have loved us, Lord. Willfully and sacrificially and practically. So much so you gave your one and only son for us. Help us to love like that. In Jesus' name, amen. The last thing I want to mention this morning. There's only one way that you're, you and I are going to accomplish this. And it's found in verse number one of chapter two. I want you to look at it. He says, therefore, if there is any encouragement, and then he says two words. Anybody know what it is? Say it real loud, Miss Corinne. In Christ. In Christ. If you go out of these doors and you try to love willfully and sacrificially and practically and you try to think others first with the mind of Christ, servant-heartedness and humbly, listen, you will fail. If it's in your own flesh, you will fail 100% of the time. The only way that we begin to think like Jesus Christ and serve like Jesus Christ and love like Jesus Christ is when we are in Jesus Christ. First and foremost, you need to be saved. That is, you need to repent of your sin and turn in faith to Jesus Christ, asking him, to come into your life, to forgive you of your sin, telling him you believe that he died on the cross and rose from the grave. Salvation is a one-time thing, and the Spirit of God renews your heart, forgives you of your sin. That has to happen in your life. If it's never happened, it needs to happen today. Once that done, the Bible says that just as you trusted in Christ, how did you trust in Christ? By faith. So walk in him. If you're going to love sacrificially, willfully, practically, if you're going to think with a servant mind, a servant heart, you have to continually walk in the Spirit of God and in Jesus Christ. That's what God is calling our church to do. To be in Him. To walk in Him. You say, Dave, how does that happen? How is that, how is that accomplished? It's, it's simple submission. It's simply saying in your mind and in your heart, I'm not going to do what I want to do. God, what do you want me to do? And then doing that thing. It's allowing the Spirit to empower you. That's where power comes from in the Christian's life. If I were to ask you this morning, do you want to think like Jesus and be servant-hearted? And do you want to love like Jesus willfully, practically, and sacrificially? If you would like that, would you say a hearty amen? amen? Then we must walk in Christ. Father God, we thank you for allowing us to come together and to worship you this morning. God, I pray that you would just allow us to do that, that we would walk in you, Lord, that we would know that it's not of our own will or of our own strength. But Lord, we do have to make a decision this morning. Are we going to live for ourselves or are we going to live for you? Are we going to live for me or are we going to live for others? I pray for every single heart that has been touched by your spirit this morning and by the word of God, that you would embolden them and give them the power through the Spirit of God to live out what you have called them to do. Help them to know they cannot do it in their own strength. Help them to rely on you. Father, I pray for those in here who want to love like you love. They want to make it a choice in their life to love the people that seem unlovable. Lord, help them to know that that will bring freedom to their life. They don't have to be bitter anymore. They don't have to be hate-filled. They can love because you have loved us. Father, I pray that they would understand that they are to be sacrificial in their love. Meet real needs with real time and real money, with real people face to face in this church. That you would make us a church that is a sacrificial church for one another 
and for the glory in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you. Do the work that only you can do. And we'll give you the praise that only you deserve. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. My hope is built on nothing less Than Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest friend